We're very fortunate that uh, this morning we have a panel of our Nobel laureates that will be speaking to us and that the state of Texas is blessed with uh, phenomenal people, including our 11 Nobel laureates, uh, two of whom are with us this morning. So uh, the uh, session is entitled Turning Basic Research into New Therapies. I'd like to introduce Dr. Huda Zogby, who you all probably saw last night at the O'Donnell Awards. Uh, she will be uh, moderating the panel for the Nobel laureates. She is a professor of pediatrics, neurology, neuroscience, and molecular and human genetics at Baylor College of Medicine. She has dedicated her life to pediatric neurology and specifically with the genetic, genetic analysis to determine what is causing the underlying neurological problems. She's an investigator with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and founding director of the Jan and Dan Duncan Neurological Research Institute at Texas Children's Hospital. She's been elected to all three academies, the National Academy of Medicine, the National Academy of Sciences, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. I'm sorry, not, um, not the National Ad Academy of Engineering yet, that will come. <laughs> uh, among Dr. Zobie's recent honors are the Shaw Prize in Life Science and Medicine, the Breakthrough Prize, in Life Sciences and the C Canadian Gardner International Prize. So uh, please welcome uh, Dr. Zobie back to the um, podium. Can I just invite them to come? Okay. Thank you, good morning. Uh, we see each other last night and again this morning. Uh, it's really been fun. Uh, to be part of this meeting. So today I have another favorite part of the meeting, and the favorite part is a conversation with Mike and Joe, as I dearly call them. Um, we know that they're, of course, Nobel laureates, have done phenomenal uh, research, and have done phenomenal mentorship to the people who've come through their lab who are now leaders and worthy also of Nobel Prizes. So we're going to keep it very informal and uh, conversational. So I'd like to invite Mike and Joe to join me. Uh, we will be sitting at the table and having a conversation about how basic research can advance health. And we're going to start with discussion of how it all started in their labs. Sure. So what we're going to do is start the conversation and maybe leave a few minutes at the end because I may not ask all the things on your mind you'd like to ask them yeah. and we'll give you a chance to ask us a few questions. I would like to start, I love retrospectives, I'd like to start by asking both of you to share with us your experience, particularly because your beautiful basic research has been inspired by patients. And that is something that's really uh, interesting and powerful at the same time. So I'd like you to share how it all started and what it led to. We'll start. Uh, Mike, I think I can start. I'm, I'm Mike, by the way. Um, <laughs> he's Joe. <laughs> um, Joe and I have uh, backgrounds in the, that are in one way similar and another way diametrically opposite. I grew up in Philadelphia the, and went to the nation's oldest medical school. Joe grew up in a town called Kings Tree, South Carolina, um, which I used to think is in the middle of nowhere. And then I realized the middle of nowhere is actually a defined place. It's the middle of nowhere. Kings Tree is sort of off to the side of the middle of nowhere, <laughs> somewhere. Um, but we both went to medical school, and Joe went to, uh, I went to the nation's oldest medical school, the University of Pennsylvania. Joe went to the nation's youngest medical school at that time called Southwestern Medical College here in Dallas. And we, be, we both were interns and residents together at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. We became friends, and um, <clears throat> then we went to the National Institutes of Health, uh, in Bethesda, Maryland, and um, there we saw two children, a brother and sister, who had, um, were hospitalized because they were having uh, 
blockages of their coronary arteries, the arteries that carry blood to the heart muscle. And the reason they were having these blockages was because um, their blood cholesterol level was 1,000 milligrams, 10 times higher than a, 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 the, a little eight-year-old and a, a five-year-old should be. And um, <clears throat> we were fascinated by this problem back was in the late 1960s. There was no, people knew very, very little. LDL itself, the, the cholesterol-carrying particle in the blood, had only recently been defined, and uh, nobody knew, had any idea what controlled the level and why it might go up in, in a child like that. We knew it was genetic, and we decided that we would try to figure out what was going on. And um, so we were totally inspired by these two little children. Um, we, uh, Joe had promised his great professor that he would come back to Dallas and start <coughs> where he had been in medical school uh, to start a program in medical genetics. If I was going to uh, work with him and, and try to figure out this disease, I would have to move to Dallas. It was not a popular idea in my, between me and my wife, especially uh, my wife. Uh, when we lived in Bethesda, Maryland, we thought that was the deep south. And uh, <laughs> coming, coming to Texas was not high on our list, but we came here. In fact, all three of us have, Huda could tell you her route to Texas, which is even more complicated than mine, much more. But at any rate, um, uh, we were fortunate. We, we set up a laboratory, and we were able to figure out what was wrong with these children. And, um, and eventually, as the technology improved, we were able to isolate the gene uh, that, caused, that was defective in this disease. And because of this, uh, uh, the idea of this program involves bringing uh, discoveries to the bedside. Um, we were fortunate that um, the system, that, uh, the biological system that we discovered turned out to be the target uh, for the statin drugs. And the, the statin drugs um, that a lot of people take to lower their LDL cholesterol uh, work through the mechanism that Joe and I had uh, found. And so uh, it's very gratifying as a physician uh, to have uh, seen uh, a discovery eventually lead to a pretty widespread therapy. Now, Professor Goldstein can tell you exactly how this drug works and what our great discovery was. Well, well first, <laughs> uh, so the little girl that we saw at the NIH is actually uh, 51 years ago is actually, in fact, I, uh, was the one who admitted her on, in, in January 1969. And um, it, her life expectancy, she was about, uh, she was like eight years of age, was, would only be about two or three years uh, unless one had a way of controlling her cholesterol. So the amazing story is that, that Mike and I uh, met this little girl Two months ago, she's now, uh, this is now 51 years, she's 60 years old, and we uh, interviewed her with uh, Alan Alda, who actually was the um, head of the interview team, and this was an amazing story because not only um, did uh, she live this 50 years, but she had multiple surgeries in, in Houston, cardiac surgeries that, that were developed during her lifetime. And so in addition to drugs, she also has a triumph of surgery. So it's an amazing story. So this little one girl and her brother who actually ended up dying of a heart attack at, uh, at a young age, like 13 or 14, was the stimulus for, as Mike pointed out, for our research. And what we basically were able to do was discover that there was a protein on the surface of, of cells, mainly in the liver, called the LDL receptor that removed LDL from the blood. And uh, this little girl and her brother turned out to have uh, gene, they had 
one gene from the mother and one gene from the father that inactivated this receptor. So they had no receptors. So no LDL, the bad cholesterol, would um, be removed into the liver. And so the cholesterol level rose uh, to as high as 800,000 milligrams per deciliter, where it should be like uh, 150 in a child of, of this age. And so we worked out the defect in this disease, and at the same time we were able to work out how this receptor worked normally. And the major uh, insight that we had on how the receptor worked normally is that we discovered it was subject to regulation by the amount of cholesterol in the cell. When you had a lot of cholesterol in the cell, the receptor would be turned off. When you had less cholesterol, it would be upregulated. And that's where the statins came in. A um, scientist at, in Japan um, dis discovered the first statin, which was called compactin, and then its name changed to, to a mavenolin, and that statin inhibited the synthesis of cholesterol in cells and the number of receptors went up and would pull cholesterol out of the cell. And that's how the statins work. It, and what Mike and I did is really figured out uh, the mechanism of how statins work. And um, the, the drugs were approved by the FDA in 1987 and now there are six statins on the market, like a tovastatin, a Lipitor, that's probably the most popular. There's fluvastatin, um, simvastatin. They have different names, different generic names, different um, uh, drug company assigned names, and as many as, uh, I think, uh, was it 40 million people are now taking statins in the U.S. And they've been now, um, over 30 prospective studies all over the world involving hundreds of thousands of people uh, where uh, the patients who are at a high risk for a heart attack are given a statin or, or a placebo and then followed for five years. And one, every study to date has shown that there's a marked reduction in the amount of coronary disease uh, by these statins. And, um, in fact, the, the studies both genetically that we did and then these clinical studies um, led the prominent um, and very well-known epidemiologist Richard Pito to make the point that the evidence that LDL is the cause of coronary disease is, the evidence for that is stronger than the evidence that cigarettes cause lung cancer. It's a very uh, important statement. Um, can I just say that um, it's sort of fitting um, that Joe and I were stimulated by a young child, a pediatric patient, to embark on our medical research career. But the same is true with Dr. Zogby, and maybe she can tell us how she uh, got interested in genetics and neurologic disease. So, you know, listening to the two of you really highlights the power of one patient, and I think that was really the case in, for my career. Um, just maybe a little historical perspective, since you went to the oldest medical school and you went to the youngest <laughs> medical school. I don't know where mine fits. This <laughs> university was established in 1866, so I went to the American University of Beirut. That's yeah. where I started my career. But the Civil War um, resulted in me immigrating to the U.S. I actually came here more or less as a refugee and then ended up to be lucky to be accepted and transferred medical school to Meharry and then came to Texas for residency and never left uh, since then. So I called Texas home. And during my pediatrics and early pediatric neurology residency, just like Mike and Joe, I encountered a patient. Her name is Ashley. And Ashley intrigued me because she was a healthy little girl till about a couple of years of age. She learned how to say a few words, social, use her hands, do everything properly as a two-year-old would. And right about that time, she lost her skills to communicate, became withdrawn, autistic features, stopped using her hands, and over five years, her motor abilities deteriorated and developed seizures. And that, to me, was really very intriguing because she was born normal 
and then develop these symptoms. And there were cases from Europe. Well, there was one report on 35 cases from Europe describing similar girls and the syndrome called Rett syndrome, but no one has seen patients in the US. And intrigued by her, I kept following and looking for girls like her, and they all look the same. So when you have this programmed loss of uh, skills, you're almost convinced this has to be a gene, but it was always one in a family. So unlike the situation where Mike and Joe were able to find inherited mutations, the child had two different mutations, recessive disease, in our case, it'll be one girl in a family. Uh, but I was somehow intuition or the fact they all look the same, the fact they were all girls, convinced it's a genetic disease and decided to pursue the genetic cause. And so went back to the lab after finishing my clinical training to learn molecular biology skills. And it took a while to find the gene because it's a sporadic disease. It's one in a family, so the genome was in sequence. There were no way to map it precisely. So it took from the day I saw the first patient till finding the gene 16 years. But we did find it in 1999. And now we know, thanks to exome sequencing and all the new technologies, that most of uh, autism and intellectual disability are like RET, a new mutation. That means that neither parent is carrier, but it's a new mutation that happens just in the fertilized uh, egg, probably a de novo mutation in a sperm. So if we fast forward to today, what we really learned, that's, I think I want to just highlight this for the, to discuss the power of patients and single cases and rare diseases, is that same gene in this particular case can give a spectrum of clinical pictures. So milder mutation can cause psychiatric symptoms rather than Rett syndrome. We also learned that the dose of this gene is critical. If you have too little of it, you get Rett syndrome, but if you have too much of it, you get another disease, progressive neurological disease called the MECP2 duplication syndrome. So we're finally now uh, preparing for clinical uh, readiness and eventually trials because we've shown in mouse models that you can reverse these diseases and using a new technology called antisense oligos, we can at least proceed with the duplication with treatment because we've seen that that works in the mouse and we're working on therapeutics for that. So I think we both share that right. really early experience, one patient that inspired us. And I think that's really fantastic to continue, I think. I don't know, do you see as much now patient inspired uh, fundamental well, discoveries? Well, many studies today, this was like an N of one in our cases, but many studies today uh, look for associations of genes with complex diseases where you have to have thousands of people and, it's, and you analyze their results statistically and they're never as clear cut as these single gene N of one type of, of mm -hmm. patients that give you really more insight into the biology if you can work out the function of the gene. Whereas the associations, you end up with, like for example, type 2 diabetes uh, has, the reports are over 100 gene associations with type 2 diabetes, each one of which is very minor and it's only statistically important because one has looked at 100 to 200,000 individuals. So that's the difference in the sort of studies that we did way back and the type of work that's being done today. So I, I think it all comes down to being able to really do fundamental work and dig deep into any gene, that, whether it's an association or causation, to really get to, to the uh, final result. Yeah. One, one of the uh, problems that's arisen um, when we were all in medical school, it was considered to be a, a, a great goal to, to become a physician and a scientist, a, a physician scientist, um, to learn medicine, but also learn science so that you could try to come up with new insights into disease and maybe cures. It's become much less common now. Uh, medical students in general uh, are going into practice uh, and many fewer of them are going into careers in where they can try to combine a clinical career and a research career. And, and that, that's, um, 
a big change in American uh, medical schools, and uh, some of us are trying to preserve the, mm -hmm. the original model. Yeah, I think that's really important. The other, but one potential change that could be positive is we're seeing more of team science. Yeah. And I think uh, perhaps with team science, you bring in physicians and scientists from different disciplines. And I think this is something we should capitalize on in Texas because we do have strength in engineering, mathematics, uh, computation. So that's probably something, you know, uh, we should be thinking about. Maybe to this point, let's imagine it's a new day and you have the charge, Mike, yeah. to write how science should be done. It's a blank <laughs> state. Forget the old system and think about, you know, you can, fund people, do right. things. How would, you, how would you do science today, given all the advances, given what we know about the importance of so many fields? How would you do it? Well, I agree uh, completely that uh, you need teams uh, now because um, there's so many different technologies that go into discovery. Uh, that's true. But you also need um, physicians who want to be part of that team. Uh, instead of uh, doing heart surgery, for example. And um, I think um, one reason I think that all three of us chose the careers we did was because there were some inspirational people who inspired us as physicians uh, to, to think deeply about disease. So I, I think one of our biggest challenges is to um, maintain the generation of leaders in academic medicine who are able to inspire young people uh, and motivate them uh, and, and encourage them, uh, yes, to be part of teams, but to actually um, be, have their major focus in life to, to find something new about disease. And we don't have enough of those kinds of people. I think, I think that's uh, uh, true universally in, in medical schools in this country. Joe, do you have any thoughts? How would you rewrite how we do well, well, organization you know, of science and medicine? Well, in the biological sciences, um, you have these study sections at the NIH that determine um, uh, grants and so forth, and in the when we were coming up, the study sections were a lot different. Actually, they were accused of being an old boys network because um, one really sort of took the uh, the best and the most creative science that was being done, and um, but then over the last twenty years with this emphasis on diversity and, and the, the change in what's going on in terms of teamwork and so forth, the study section at the NIH has sort of changed. In fact, some people have considered it to be socialistic as, as against the old boys network where one actually um, has to give a certain amount of grants to each state in a certain proportion. That never happened in the old days. So in that sense, you, you're really having committees decide the creativity in science. And the question is whether that's really good. I don't think that is the best way. I'm not sure how one could redesign the system today. When the NIH study section, for example, was originally um, started, there were very few uh, scientists that were working, and therefore it was a lot different. Today, it's, it's an amazing number of grants flood the NIH. It's very hard to get good people to be on the committees, and so, so that is a, this is a problem in, in science today, especially for young people who try to get started and where they need NIH grants to fund their labs, plus they need grants to, to get promoted, and so that's a problem that one should really think about in a deep way. Do you have any suggestions? Um, I think that it's hard to come up with very specific suggestions we can have a, well, our discussion on this, but somehow we're all, uh, or young people, are being dragged down by exactly what you said. 
you know, the tenure clock and the publication and this and that, which sometimes stops people from doing long-term, exciting, uh, really new path charting discoveries. So I think somehow we need to think of a way to really encourage team science to solve these big problems and acknowledge people if they're part of a team. I think physics and engineering has done better work right, in that right. with LIGO and other projects, whereas biology is still, I think they've done it well in the genome arena, but not as much in other domains of science. So somehow we have to think of a way to reward people and acknowledge contributions at the individual level if people are really trying to solve a very complex problem. We'll see if the Brain Initiative yeah. does some of that. Um, one thing I was thinking about, and this is, I love your input on, when I reflect on what Texas did for health and uh, discoveries in the areas of health, it is really amazing. It is truly the pioneer state. Think about it. Heart, trans heart uh, surgeries, Surgery. heart yeah. surgeries were pioneered in Texas with the work of late Michael DeBakey and then Cooley and others. That saves hundreds of thousands, I don't know how many, you know, millions probably of lives. Uh, metabolism. And we that was the only place where um, people from around the world would, would come. come. And there's an interesting story in Dallas is that um, Dr. DeBakey would have patients from all over the Middle East and everywhere. And many of those patients ended up in Dallas because the, the private hospital in Dallas turns out to be called Baylor University Hospital. And so they came to Dallas rather than to Houston. Yes. So basically, that's really one area where we were absolutely the world leaders. Other area, we heard about lipid metabolism and really expanded to other metabolism with the work of Helen and others, again, uh, and, and David. Uh, it's been really fantastic. So that's another big area. Uh, cancer, I think there is no doubt cancer has been huge with work from MD Anderson and many other universities. And the fourth area, which is really now what's going to change medicine, is genetics with the work of our genome center in Houston and all the genetic discoveries that came out. You know. uh, so take those four big areas. Really what's, what's left, I would say, in the big impact on health system is neurological and psychiatric, but that's being slowly solved by some of these genetic discoveries. So we are that. We are absolutely the leader in that. Have we capitalized on this? What can we do to capitalize more? How can we do this to really keep pushing Texas and prepare it for the next wave of impacting health through genetic discoveries and genome work and the new technologies? So this is, I think, what we should be thinking about. I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. Well, I know there are um, a lot of people uh, attending this meeting who are involved in venture capital. We've heard several very good talks about how to uh, bridge the gap between uh, basic discovery and um, commercialization. Um, and at least in the area of, uh, and of course Texas has led the way in some aspects of that, certainly in electronics and in um, <coughs> and anything to do with the oil and, and gas industry. But we haven't uh, been leaders in the development of uh, new biotechnology companies and um, part of that is, is uh, we in Dallas have done a whole lot of self soul searching and mea culpas and all kinds of things uh, because um, Dallas has not up until recently has not had a, a really successful biotechnology company I don't think Houston really has either in terms of a long-term successful company or San Antonio or any of the other cities. So, um, and the question is why is that? And um, part of the reason has been that venture capitalists in, in Texas have had a pretty short time horizon. Um, you, we heard this morning about how um, the, the new venture capital is heavily concentrated in instrumentation uh, because it's, you know, if somebody invents a new instrument, you know pretty soon uh, whether it's going to be a commercial success or not. 
But if you're uh, trying to uh, invent a new drug and it's got to go through all kinds of animal testing and then human testing, and you know, we're talking about horizons of 10 years, and the, it seems like the, the investors, venture capitalists in Texas, don't have that kind of patience uh, and that kind of appetite for failure because of most of these things fail. So uh, whereas for some reason in California and in Massachusetts, uh, uh, that hasn't happened. And so that's where most of the new biotech companies have sprung up. Um, so we in Dallas are trying to change that. I mean, we just had our first really big commercial success. We, we uh, some scientists at our university uh, um, invented a drug for the treatment of kidney cancer uh, started a company and within eight years that company was just acquired by Merck for a billion dollars up front and then another billion in milestones potentially. So, um, so we can do it and we can uh, bring a financial reward and at least we've, we've shown that that can happen. Uh, but um, there's, there's, no, there's no lack of ideas being generated here. Mm -hmm. it, it's a matter of the, the uh, commercial investment. So the question also is, what do you think about um, recruiting to Texas mm -hmm. is much more difficult than recruiting to San Francisco or to Boston. And we see this in Dallas with some of the great recruitees that we try to land and in many cases, um, issues come up on um, education and um, gun control. These are the two right. major issues that, and schools. Those would be the three major issues that come up. I don't know if you see that in Houston also. I, we do see that. I think, you know, we, we, we all succeed in recruiting great talent, but we lose really wonderful people. They are concerned about the public school systems. And we heard uh, yesterday from Emily that one in four or one in five students may not graduate from college in Texas, which is, tells you that our school system is really not adequate and we need to work on that. Some people do not want to be in a state where there is not uh, strong gun control. So I think it is affecting us, attracting the absolute broad talent sometimes we want. And I think it's something that TAMIS could increase awareness of and help us. Really, at least we can start with the school system because that's perhaps actionable and really important. And that, I think, will elevate everything. It will elevate the people that go into the universities and, uh, and will uh, improve the science engine as well and the discoveries. I, I think you can probably comment, you know, more about this than me also how the state's reaction to certain things can affect us, make us lose people. Not right. only we can't, I think Herman Muller, right. the Nobel laureate. So, so is, that's an interesting um, story. So probably the most famous Nobel laureate from Texas um, was a guy named Herman Muller who came to Austin in 1920. And um, he was a geneticist. And he discovered that when he uh, subjected fruit flies to radiation, he produced mutations. And this was really the beginning of the understanding of, of what genes were about. And, um, and Muller uh, stayed in Austin for about 12 years. And during that period of time, he became, his work became instantly popular. And he was elected to the National Academy of Science at a very young age. But he also had a lot of socialistic ideas, and he ran an un, uh, underground press in which he pressed, he was way ahead of his time, for women's rights, for uh, rights for African Americans, more stricter gun control, just the sort of stuff that we're talking about today. And his conservative colleagues in Austin turned him into the FBI, and ultimately he lost his job. He couldn't get a job in the U.S. He went to Moscow for about five years, and then finally he got a job at the University of Indiana, and his first graduate student turned out to be James Watson of Watson and Crick. And, and then he won the Nobel Prize several years after that. He won it by himself 
who is really the beginning of modern genetics, the way one thinks about genes. So this is an example of, the question is, what if Herman Muller had been embraced by Austin and Texas and stayed here, would, would Texas be sort of the Silicon Valley of the future? That was in the 1920s, 1930s. So that's an example of, of one we really lost. So, so I think given the strengths we have in the areas we discussed, given that Texas has been pioneered in so many areas, the key is our educational system, make Texas a more attractive environment to scientists like a young Herman Muller, and holding on to our scientists, really. And then really thinking futuristically about how we can take discoveries uh, with better biotech and Keep, keep being leaders and capitalizing on the amazing strength. I mean, when you think about the few areas we discussed, right. this is really the most, among the most important things for human health. So I think this is, we have the substrate. We just need to push in a few areas and, and attract the best and retain them. So this would be really something for Tamis to think about uh, collectively with us. Okay. Yeah, I, I'd just like to add that Tamis, the Tamis members and the people who come to these, uh, this, these meetings, uh, you know, I'd like them to go back to their communities and be spokesmen for, for science in general and, and for, you know, for improving their respect for science and, and, and what science and innovation uh, can, can lead. And that if Texas is going to succeed in the future, um, it's not only going to be through fracking, it's going to, it's going to be through um, recognizing our state as, as a site for innovation. And there are a lot of corporations moving here now, especially mm -hmm. leaving California because of the tax situation. Uh, and um, so and we, we do have a tremendous opportunity here. Mm -hmm. um, and housing too, that's a real attraction. But mm -hmm. I do think that, um, you know, in an, in an era where people don't vaccinate their children because they have this myth that somehow it causes autism uh, to, uh, you know, other, other anti-scientific, you know, global warming doesn't really exist. And uh, all these unscientific attitudes that people have. I think it's our responsibility, I, I take it as one, my responsibility in, in my community to, to be a spokesman for, for rational thought and for, and for science um, as, as a way of solving problems and, and uh, innovation as the, as the way to the future. If, um, and we, we're facing a situation now where that whole philosophy is, is, mm -hmm. is under challenge. So in the interest of giving the audience an opportunity, there are microphones on either side and we'll take a couple of questions. We have to finish at 11.30, so we have five minutes for special questions. How did, how did I get to use Lipitor? <laughs> it's from uh, your beginnings. Can you say anything, is there anything to be learned about the commercialization process of, your, of the statins? Well, the, as Dr. Goldstein mentioned, um, the first statin drug, the actual molecule, was discovered in Japan, but the Japanese never commercialized it. And um, it was the Merck company here in the United States, under the leadership of, of a man named Roy Vagelos, uh, that made the investment and, and, pi and persevered. Um, Joe and I were behind him all the way um, because we knew that this was a rational drug and, and, and we knew how it was going to work. Uh, the Japanese company was just too timid to, to actually develop it commercially. Uh, I don't think they understood the mechanism of how it worked. but. Um, it was, it was an Amer so it's ironic that the, the actual molecule was discovered in Japan, but the commercialization was done in the US. Usually we think of things opposite from that. Uh, and, but it was the, it was the courage of, uh, of Roy Vagelos to, um, to develop a totally new untested 
type uh, approach to, to treatment uh, that made it possible. Actually, it was relatively fast. It was mm -hmm. um, less than 10 years from when Merck started working on it until the FDA approval, which is, you know, for a new drug in a class that never had had a really good drug, that was really quite fast in those days. There is one, uh, if I can add one anecdote. That, um, well, we have another question, maybe we should take that. Go ahead. Go ahead with the anecdote. <laughs> what you, you have to say as much. The anecdote, it, well, it's, it's an interesting thing about the commercial, uh, how one values something. So the Japanese, when they had discovered this, uh, they didn't want to develop it themselves. They shopped it around to American drug companies and they offered it to Merck and they, it was in exchange for a Merck antibiotic that was in, under development. And the question is, was the antibiotic worth as much as the first statin? So Merck sent a team of marketing people to the American College of Cardiology meeting and they handed out a questionnaire to the heart specialists and they said, what level of blood cholesterol do you think a drug treatment would be indicated? And uh, the, uh, the answer came back and the average answer, was, this is in the 1970s, was I wouldn't use a drug unless the cholesterol in the patient was over 350 milligrams. <laughs> And uh, the Merck marketing people looked at their actuarial tables and they decided that um, there weren't enough people with cholesterol levels that high to make, and so their antibiotic was worth much more than the statin, so they turned down the deal. Uh, and, uh, but under Vagilos, they then went out to look for their own molecule and, and they found one that acted like the Japanese one and that's the one that they commercialized. But the point was that the marketing people could see the past, which is what the doctors told them were current attitudes. They couldn't see the future, which is the fact that we're now trying to get everybody down below 200, not 350. Hi, I'm Dave Pinnock Worms. I had the pleasure of meeting both of you 10 years ago while I was interviewing for a job at UT Southwestern. I'm sure a thousand faces that, that you could go through, but uh, thank you for spending quality hours with me several years ago. I'm an MD, PhD, also physician scientist, uh, about a half a generation behind you. Uh, and reflecting on the last 40 to 50 years of the training of MD, PhDs and physician scientists along the stories that you, you had mentioned, and I just wanted to make a, a couple of comments and then an opportunity that we might consider. Uh, along the themes that you had mentioned, um, there's an issue of guilds. MDs formed guilds, engineers formed guilds you know, certifications of entry have been fundamental to the societal processes. Biological PhDs did not form guilds due to the Oxfordian history of, of scholarship. But it's had consequences now at medical schools uh, in, in, in the economic pressures that we have. Back in the days of the NIH and the early years, I was at a, another southern medical school, Duke University, in my training, et cetera. The differences in pay between the physicians practicing at a university and the PhDs in the laboratory research was not that great. Maybe 20, 25 percent, you know, 40, 50 years ago. Uh, now, I think in part because of the economic pressures of the guilds and the influences that they have then on the economics of uh, the, the, the physicians are paid much, much more, even in an academic center, than, than the PhD scale biological scientists. What, what that sets up then is a trap for the physician scientists that get caught then by medical school administration, and that's the pay gap. You want physician scientists that typically have 70, 80 percent time in the laboratory to bring their insight from the patient to the laboratory. And as we all know, as leadership, then you're always dealing with that gap. We, we struggle with it at MD Anderson, I'm sure uh, UT Southwestern does too. And it's the physician scientists then that get under the pressure. How many RVUs do you bring in? How are you going to fill that gap? Who's going to pay? And then it, you get into all kinds of mission issues. Is there an opportunity, I guess this is what I wanted to dialogue on, where TAMIST and SEPRIT might be able to take advantage of that for the physician scientists training and or attraction to Texas if we had a program to set up through TAMIST or, or, or CPRIT 
specifically going after that gap for the talented physician scientists that are on the coast that we might want to bring to the third coast. Wanted to open up some dialogue about that and maybe some action items that we might be able to together think about. Well, that's a big, uh, that's a big question. I, I, um, and it goes very deeply into, into what the, the value of an academic career is and is do, as, as a scientist, do you gain something else from the privilege of doing science um, that makes up for the fact that you don't earn as much money? I don't know. Uh, take a long time to answer that question. It's uh, above my pay grade. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, this isn't about the pay, per se, on that. It's just to help administrators help support the role of the physician scientist. But yeah, but we can dialogue on that off, offline. But I think that's an important right. opportunity. Well, we can talk about it after yeah. this. We're over our time as Oh, it thank is. you. Well, I think this was one for great suggestion. I think it'll, it'll be a great point for discussion. But I'd like to maybe conclude by thanking both of you for sharing wonderful retrospective and discussion of the future. And I think, as you said, that the Merck and the cardiology interaction, that anecdote, yeah. people could not think about the future. They were still going about what they learned. And I think what science is telling us, there are many surprises. And we have a lot of opportunities in health care and research to improve health care now given all the discoveries. So let's all leave here thinking about the future. In a Great. positive Thank way. You. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you.